You're listening to the Cyberwire Network, powered by N2K. Hello, everyone, and a warm welcome to the Hacking Humans podcast brought to you by N2K Cyberwire. This is the show where every week we delve into the world of social engineering scams, phishing plots, and criminal activities that are grabbing headlines and causing harm to organizations all over the world. I'm Dave Bittner, and joining me is my co-host, Joe Kerrigan. Hi, Joe. Hi, Dave. We've got some great stories to share, but first, a word from our show sponsor. But first, a word from our sponsors at Know Before. Time travel would be a particularly powerful tool in the hands of any overworked InfoSec professional. Think about it. Being able to see the future and know which malicious emails would be missed by all the existing filters. Your ability to stay one step ahead of the bad actors would rise to a whole new level. Unfortunately, our sponsors haven't cracked time travel just yet. They are, however, introducing a new phishing protection product that can block and remove dangerous phishing emails before your users even see them. Stay with us, and in a few minutes, you'll learn how. All right, Joe, uh, we're going to jump right into our stories here this week. Uh, let me kick things off for us. As so, you wish, uh, Dave. <laughs> I, I, uh, I saw this story come by from the folks at Wired, uh, and this uh, is sort of a handy how-to. It's called How to Spot Business Email Compromise Scams. Ooh. It's written by Justin Pott, uh, one of the writers over there at uh, Wired. I thought it was a really good guide. And, and the other thing I like about this is uh, this is one of those things you can forward to your friends and your family and your loved ones. Uh, I guess in particular your work colleagues would right. be uh, particularly helpful for this. Yes. So, uh it is business email compromise. That's right. right. <laughs> That's right. But, you know, a lot of the lessons you can learn here apply to all sorts of scams. But absolutely. This is, abs- this is uh, targeted on, on the business email compromise. So I mean, a couple of interesting things I took away from this article here. Business email compromise scams generate over $26 billion annually. Yeah. Billion with a B. Right. And the <laughs> average payout per, uh, per successful scam is pretty high. Yeah. It's it I don't know what it is but I frequently see hundreds of thousands of dollars lost to these guys and occasionally millions. Yeah. Oh yeah, they go into the millions. And of course, you know, it, we talk about these uh all the time here, but for folks who uh, may not be all that familiar with it, this is where uh folks uh, they get into your email or one of your colleagues' emails and uh generally they impersonate your colleagues. Mm-hmm. Very well, um, actually. Yeah, and quite often they will impersonate your boss or someone who is important within your organization. Um, these are the the scams where you get a message from your CEO asking you to go buy some gift cards. Have you ever gotten one of these, Joe? I, I have, Dave. Yeah, yeah, I fell for it too. Um, really? <laughs> I didn't fall. Well, it was it was the beginning of the scam. It was. Uh, Back when I was with ISI, okay. I got an email impersonating Tony DeBora, who's yeah. my boss, and uh, he said, um, it was just, are you available? Uh-huh. And I- I've told this story before. Yeah, I yeah, grab yeah. my notebook, I reply, yes, and I run downstairs. You sprinted and, down the hall. Sprinted down, <laughs> I, down the stairs. Good, good employee that you are. <laughs> right. <laughs> Skipping every other step. Yes. Oh, I get to see my boss. Actually, I really, really am a big fan of Tony. But anyway, um, the uh, I get down there, and his office is empty. And uh, Laura, who is the uh, head administrator, walks out and goes, I think that email was a scam. And I was like, ah, <laughs> got me. Oh. You know? Had she gotten it too? I think so, yeah. Okay. I think everybody got it. Oh. And it came from just a Gmail address. So it wasn't a business email compromise attack. It was just a um, uh, just a gift card scam coming from an outside email address. Right, impersonating, impersonating. your boss. Right, it was more of an impersonation scam. Yeah, yeah. So that's one of the the ways that they do it. This article points out that um, one of the other really popular avenues is that um, they will uh, contact an employee in payroll, for mm-hmm. example, and ask them to change direct deposit information. Yes. So someone will pretend to be you or me, send an email to the payroll person and say, hey, listen, uh, you know, here's a routine thing. I just changed banks. And, right. uh, you know, well, <laughs> uh, here's my new routing information. Yes. And, and then they get the paycheck. Right. Two yeah. weeks from now, whatever your paycheck is goes in. And, and you know, we might take somebody 
depending on your financial situation, it might take somebody a week or two or a, or a payroll cycle to even detect that something like this has happened. Yeah, that's not me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's me either. I notice. <laughs> right. Quickly. Right. <laughs> I notice when the mortgage company calls and right. says, hey, where, why haven't you paid us? Right. Go, what? Because <laughs> I haven't been paid. <laughs> so um, this article has a lot of uh, great tips here for how to uh, spot these things and avoid them. Something we talk about all the time, question urgency. Right. Right. The scammers, they try to put you in a state of stress uh, to shut down your critical thinking. So th they say, you know, take a step back, calm down, take a deep breath and reassess what's going on here. Yep. They point out that a red flag is if someone asks you to keep the request confidential. That is 100% correct. Yeah. And, you know, this is something that you, you wouldn't be out of the ordinary, I guess, if, if it was from your boss or from an executive in your organization. Then they might say, hey, you know, we've got, a, we've got an important deal going here. Right. And it's important that we keep this confidential. And I need you to, you know, we don't want this deal to fall through, so I need you to transfer this money and... Uh, do it on the on the QT. Right, on the um, down low. That's right. That's right. Um, and actually, uh, Selena Larson, a friend of the show, a friend of the Cyberwire, and uh, my co-host on the new podcast, Only Malware in the Building, <laughs> <laughs> which you should all should check out. Uh, she's quoted in this article saying, just breathe, slow down, and think critically. And uh, all good advice. Yeah. Um, they say that you should confirm through a second channel. Yes. Very good. At, uh, so if someone makes a request... If they do it via email, pick up the phone. Right. You know, do what you do. Go down the hall. Yes. Right. <laughs> right. That, and that's exactly what I did. That's when I, I realized it was fake right away as soon as I saw the dark office. But I have a horror story about this. Oh. And it it's anecdotal and I can't, you know, somebody, the person who told it to me wouldn't, of course, tell me where this happened. Okay. But um, a junior employee got an email saying, change our banking information for our payment stuff from a, from a vendor for a company. Okay, yeah. And yeah. Uh, he, he went to the senior employee and said, this kind of looks suspicious. And the guy said, yeah, it is suspicious. Give him a call. So he calls him, and then the junior employee comes back and goes, yeah, everything's good. We should, we should change, the, change the money, change the direction of the money. Mm -hmm. So they change the direction of the money, and the vendor calls him up and goes, hey, where's my money? What had happened was... The junior employee called the company that was being victimized here. Uh, and it was a business email compromise attack. Didn't get the guy on the phone. So he left a voicemail that said, are you trying to change your banking details? Because we got an email that says you're trying to change your banking details. The voicemail system transcribed that email and sent an email or transcribed that voicemail and sent an email to the inbox of the person whose email address had been compromised. Oh, wow. And the scammer said... Uh, sent him an, uh, another email and said, yeah, I got your voicemail. That is us. That's fine. That's, that, that's legit. Wow. And that was the verification. So he did not verify through two channels, mm -hmm. but he thought he had. Yeah. Uh, he only verified through the email channel. Right. But he didn't know that the, he didn't know that the email was, or the voicemail was going to be transcribed and emailed to the guy. Yeah. So. Wow. Yeah. Well, and this article kind of touches on that. It says to avoid the contact de details that are in the suspicious email, right? So in other words, you get an email from somebody uh, and you think it's suspicious, don't use the contact details at the bottom of that email. Right. Because the phone number is probably to the scammers. Right, not the that's actual a good point. Company. That's a good point too. Count on it. Like we always talk about, you know, look up the phone number. <laughs> if you have to go to the library and get a phone book. <laughs> I, I hate that we have to say this because... Like all of, you know, so many of our, what, I will use air quotes, trusted sources aren't are trusted sources anymore. Are gone. Yeah. yeah. You uh, can't, what, you can't yeah, count you, on Google to give you the no. right information. Oh, what, what a terrible, and it's such, it's such an awful solution. You know, I, I was trying to get in touch with, um, with somebody recently Yeah. Uh, at, at one of my financial institutions. Okay. So I called customer service. And uh, or I Googled customer service, but I wound up you know, skipping over whatever Google told me that may have been the right number. I didn't even look at it. I've trained myself. I went to the website and clicked on contact us. Okay. But Google gives me a phone number right at the top. Right. I, it might be legit. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Can't trust them. No. What a world, Joe. What a world. It's a terrible <laughs> world. The internet sucks now, Dave. <laughs> they also make the point that uh, it's good to proactively... 
um, save the phone numbers that you know are legit into your on your mobile device or in your company directories. Right. So when so you you're not do this when you're not in a situation of where time matters. Yeah, and you know? that takes a little bit of forethought and right. and maybe a little bit of adversarial thinking on your part. Yeah, uh, which a lot of people just don't have. And in fact, I've said many times that when I demonstrate adversarial thinking, I often offend people. Right. Um, you know, they think you're a monster. Why would you think that way? But <laughs> I do think that way because the bad guys think this way. Right. Right. <laughs> but yeah, um, you have to think that you have to think about that in advance. Yeah. Yeah. They talk about uh, following proper protocols for yes. companies, like to have. You know these proper processes in place yes, in your organization. Absolutely imperative here. It's one of the key things to protect yourself from these kind of attacks. Right, right. To have a just having a second set of eyes on something. Yep. You know, a lot of organizations uh, before a you know if a check more than a certain amount of money requires two signatures, uh, and those types of things I think are excellent to have in place because the second person is likely not to have had their critical thinking shut down by some time sensitive, you know, emotional trigger that the, right. the bad guys are so good at. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's exactly right. They may, they may provide a moment of clarity. Right. Right. And then they also say, just avoid using email for sensitive workflows. <laughs> you know, financial, financial stuff shouldn't, shouldn't primarily rely on email. Yeah, agreed. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I've, I've said this many times here as well. Email is still terrible. Right. It's just awful. Yeah. All the security is bolted on after the fact. I mean, it was developed in the 60s as, as a way to communicate amongst academic institutions. Mm -hmm. And not a lot has changed except for the addition of these literally added on after the fact. Um, that, and they even rely on a different, completely different system, the domain name system. Yeah. To, to function. So, yeah. Um, yeah. It's, I, I maintain that email is still terrible. Yeah. And then they have a couple tips here for leaders and folks in organizations. You know, they say foster open communications. Absolutely. Have a culture of transparency and also make it a safe place where people feel like if they are worried that they did something wrong, that they can tell somebody without feeling like, you know, the hammer is going to come down on them. Yeah. Uh, um, Perry Carpenter, who also has a show on this, on our network. Right. If Layer Insights, uh, since we're plugging shows, Dave. Um, <laughs> Perry Carpenter has a great saying about this. He says, uh, you are always doing something to modify your company's security culture. You're either improving it or you're making it worse, hmm. is what he says. That's and interesting. That's correct. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. And then, and then just, to, again, they say have a, a culture where you're openly talking about scams. So sending this information out to your employees so that it's on their radar so that they can uh, know what to look for and, and that these conversations don't have any shame. You know, right. that these, can be, these can be conversations around the water cooler or, you know, these days virtually with so many folks remote. But um, the more information you can share, then the better off you're going to be. So to that point, uh, we will have a link to this story in the show notes. But I, I think it's a good one to... Uh, to send around, and uh, it only takes a couple minutes to read through it, but it's a lot of good information in one small, concise package. It so is. It's uh, very nice. Nice thing from the folks at Wired. All right, Joe. Well, before we get to your story here today, we're going to take a quick break to hear from our show sponsor. We were talking about mitigating cyber threats to your organization before your users even see them. The new Fish ER Plus from Nobefore was developed to help you supercharge your organization's email security defenses. How? You get a unique crowdsourcing advantage. More than 10 million highly trained Nobefore end users from across the globe catch and report malicious email that makes it through all the filters. Know Before's Threat Lab then validates it with AI and with human researchers. Fish ER Plus blocks phishing threads other tools have missed and proactively removes them from your users' inboxes. Not quite time travel, but we think you'll agree it's a vital capability in any InfoSec professional's arsenal. Visit knowbefore.com slash products slash fish ER dash plus to learn more. 
That's knowbefore.com slash products slash fish er dash plus. And we thank Knowbefore for sponsoring our show. All right, we are back. Uh, Joe, what do you got for us here today? Dave, I wanted to talk about two scams. These are not business or professional scams. These are like interpersonal scams. These are scams that you're going to get at home. Yeah. And I have two of them here. One of them was sent in by a listener uh, named Jay, who says, Hi, guys, here's a scam that one of my family members from New Zealand sent to me. Huh. Uh, And it's a posting from, it looks like Facebook, maybe some, I don't know. Yeah. I don't spend a lot of time on social media, Dave, deliberately. <laughs> it does look like Facebook. Yeah. Right. Uh, so it's a posting in a group from a lady named Liz and it says, scam alert, please let anyone with a landline know, especially older friends and family, had a call from a private number on my landline today from a young guy with a British accent claiming to be Detective Constable Rogers from the Auckland Central Police Station. So interesting that it has a British accent and is call, calling you in New Zealand. Mm-hmm. And slightly different accents in England, Australia, New Zealand. They're all, they, and they can tell. Yeah, but I wonder, I wonder. you know, I, this is something I honestly don't know the answer to. I wonder, do, do New Zealanders hold the British accent in the same type of high regard that we do here in the U.S.? I uh, suspect probably not. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Hmm? I okay. don't know. Carry on. I, I, I've, I can tell the difference, but I, I, don't, I don't know that I can nail it. Yeah. But I prefer the New Zealand accent. Mm. He was advising me that they had arrested an individual in the city overnight and that he was in possession of 13 different ETF POS cards. That's electronic funds transfer payments, point of sale cards. Okay. Credit cards of some kind. Okay. One of which had my name on it. Hmm. He asked me to check and make sure I still had all of my cards and none of them had been stolen and they hadn't been. Uh, Apparently, the cards were all from around my area, so he must have been targeting my area. Hmm. Then he asked me, this is the scammer, uh, to write down his details and gave me his name and badge number, Detective Constable Rogers, BA5513. He then told me to call 111, which is like the emergency number in New Zealand, I guess. Yeah. uh, And to do a police ID check to verify that he uh, he was with the police. To do this, all I had to do was enter 111 on the phone and it would be, and it would disconnect our call and transfer me to emergency services. Hmm. I did this and ha- hung up when the phone started ringing on the other end. Uh, I called from my mobile instead and confirmed that it is definitely a scam. So he called back again a couple hours later, not realizing he had already spoken with me, repeated the same script, but gave me a totally different badge number which is great. When when I questioned him on the detail, he started to joke around and said that he'd been promoted to superintendent since we last spoke a couple hours ago. (laughs) Fast promotion rated that that police department. Quick ceremony, yeah. Uh, He knew he was busted in the end of the call. Liz says she's reported this. Uh, Jay goes on to say the interesting part of this one is that the scammer uh, will tell the victim they're going to transfer the call to emergency services by having them dial 111 while they're still connected. Right. This won't do anything. Right. Right? It's just pushing numbers on the phone. Yeah. Didn't you ever annoy your friends when you were a kid by pushing numbers on the phone? All the time. Yeah, me too. <laughs> you try to come up with music to play? Yeah, play songs, whatever. Right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it was very loud and very annoying. Yeah. Um, but then what would happen is they would just play, the, uh, play a ringing sound and then somebody else would answer the phone, or maybe he's even the same guy with a different, you know, change his voice up a little bit. Yeah. And he he would confirm the badge number, and that would lend authenticity to the call. Hmm. So uh, it th- that's not how any of this works. Right? <laughs> right. When when you get one of these calls in, uh, you know, call your bank on the known good number on the back of the the credit card, and if 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 you think your card has been stolen, cancel it. Yeah. Um. Next, uh, next one comes from Allison Gormley, who is a uh, consumer report or consumer writer reporter rather at WTHR in Indianapolis. Okay. And my daughter sent, uh, sent me uh, an Instagram post and we'll put a link to it in the show notes. She has a ton of videos on the gram that start with, uh, Hey Allison, where somebody, the, the person with the phone filming her is asking her questions. Okay. <laughs> and this one starts with, uh, somebody saying, Hey Allison, a stranger sent me money on Venmo. Should I send it back? 
Have you heard about this? Mm. This is the accidental payment scam. Okay. So yes. Here, yes, I have heard of this. Here's what happens. Somebody sends you $200 on Venmo, uh-huh. and you get an alert that says somebody you don't know has, char- has sent you $200. Immediately, you get a message that requests $200 in payment from you, mm-hmm. and they send a message that says, I'm so sorry, I sent that to the wrong ID. Can you please send my money back? Hmm. Okay? So if you send your money back, you think everything's fine. But really, the initial transfer was done with a stolen credit card. That gets challenged, and they won't pay it. Oh. Uh, So you're now stuck with a $200 debit, essentially. You just gave somebody $200. Right. So the when the credit card is challenged and that money, that initial payment gets backed out of your Venmo account right. because it was fraudulent. Right. But there's a time delay there. And so you're out yes. the money. It's very similar to the floating check scam, but using Venmo. Okay. Um, wow. So it, the, the problem is that Venmo views these as two completely atomic transactions. They are not related at all. I see. In your head, they are absolutely related. Mm -hmm. In the system, they are not. And Venmo probably says to you, well, you sent the money. You you, you pressed the button. Exactly. We we didn't have anything to do with it. You weren't scammed. (laughs) You did it under your own will. I mean, you were scammed, but it's not like somebody broke into your device and made this happen. You you manually... Sent somebody $200. Yeah, triggered You committed the transaction. Interesting. Right. Mm -hmm. So Venmo has a statement out that says uh, Venmo is only a uh, a system that should be used among people who know and trust each other. Mm-hmm. Okay? It's like waving cash around, essentially. Right. Um, <laughs> so, you know, walking around with Venmo in your in your pocket. I have Venmo. I use it a little bit. Uh, I, you know, I, I kind of like the convenience of it. Yeah. But I'm really starting to not like the, <laughs> the, the convenience of it with yeah. the way they just don't stand behind the customers. But it's not a payment card. It's just, it's a, it's a, a quick transfer application. Yeah. The other thing that uh, I find odd about Venmo, and I would say in our household, uh, my wife pretty much handles the the Venmo transfers and things. You right. know, like if, if I need to send somebody something with Venmo, I call my wife and I say, honey, will you please send such? <laughs> and she takes <laughs> right. care of it. Um, and it's it all works out better that way. Right. But um, one of the things she's pointed out to me is that I guess when you spin up a Venmo account, it defaults to making all of your transactions public. It does. Which is bonkers to me. It, that, isn't that nuts? <laughs> it's uh, nuts. I knew that when I opened my Venmo account, and the very first thing I did was set all my transactions to private. Yeah. And I'm seeing on all the people I've I've interacted with, I can see they're, they're like, it's like a social media app. Right. Yeah, right. So-and-so sent this money. I can She's see like, every payment yeah. somebody makes to my daughter for lunch when right. she buys lunch. She's like, hey, Dave, looks like our county council person paid off, paid their dog walker. You right. Know, what, how could this be the default? It makes right. no sense. Why Terrible. would you think this would be something that you would want to share publicly? I have I, no idea. No. What, what about what about the case where you look down there and you say, oh, this person's buying drugs. <laughs> 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 it just has like five marijuana leaves in the, you're like, uh-oh. Right. Yeah, I mean, I, I, it makes no sense to me. So, so to our listeners, be yeah. careful. Check your Venmo. Yeah, make sure your your postings aren't public because, you know, clearly a lot of people are unaware that their postings are public and right. prefer they not be. Right. So, all right, interesting stuff. So, uh, as always, we will have links to those in the show notes, and of course, we would like to hear from you if there's something you'd like us to consider for our show. You can email us. It's hackinghumans at n2k.com. All right, Joe, it is time to move on to our catch of the day. Dave, our catch of the day comes from Cameron, who writes, I wanted to start out by saying how much I love the show and appreciate the valuable information you provide each week. Thank you, Cameron. Yes, Can I nice. say Cam is the man? <laughs> Cam the man. <laughs> Cam the man. <laughs> As a business owner with a public-facing email address, I get my fair share of scam emails. But this one made me chuckle. Hmm. I'm based in Australia. Here we are again with those. Yeah. That that collection of we accents. We're spending our show down under today. That's right. <laughs> So the idea of the Euro Millions office randomly wanting to send me money by replying to a Gmail address 
while the original email was sent from a Wisconsin-based health provider, struck me as somewhat odd. Hmm. Somewhat odd, Cameron? He's, <laughs> <laughs> you know, he's, he's being understated. It's, right. It's, the, it's that rapier-like uh, wit from, you know, south of the equator. That's right. <laughs> it's, uh, there's a screenshot here, Dave, that okay. is from Euromillions. Now, remember what we say about lottery scams, Dave. Yeah, yeah. they are, what? What do we say? You got to play to win. It's the oh, old, that's right. The old Maryland lottery slogan. That's true. You got to play to win. I was going to say that lo- that lotteries are attacks on people who don't understand math. Well, yeah, the lottery but... itself is already a scam, <laughs> right? <laughs> You're right. 100% okay. correct. All right, it goes like this. Congratulations, winner. Euro Millions and partners did a random selection through email selection globally to help many out of the intense global economic recession. You are one of the lucky winners of the Euro Millions promotion held on 2605 2024. Your email address picked the ticket reference, which attracted the winning prize of 1,111,176 British pounds. That's a lot of ones, Dave. That's a lot of ones. Reply back with the winning ref attached to your email and your full details for instructions on how to claim your winning amount. The tickets were jointly purchased by NGOs, and this winning information will be valid for only seven working days from the date of this notice. (laughs) There's the artificial time horizon. Send your full names, address, and phone number through this email, alfredolapaz at (laughs) outlook.com, for the immediate processing of your winning amount. Alfredo de la Paz, promotion director. Okay. Alfredo has a, a an Outlook.com address. Sure. Not a Euro Millions. I don't even know if that's the lottery <laughs> in, in, in Europe. Yeah. Um, I, I love how it says that you have, you've won a million, a million dollars, but then when you see the, or pounds, I guess, but when you see the number of pounds, it's a billion. Oh, in, yeah, you're right. In the... Uh, oh, you know, well, that's, tr- yeah, I guess that's right. I, I, I was a little confused because sometimes uh, in the UK, you know, they use They use decimals commas instead of commas for periods. Or, yeah, right, but, something like that. Yeah. And by periods, I mean the groups of three numbers. That's what those are called, Correct. periods. I actually know the names of these things. Yeah, they group them together differently than we do, which causes confusion for yes. us. So, <laughs> Dave, if I could talk about knowing the names of things. Yeah. Uh, do you know what those little uh, crosses in your window are called? If you have the little crosses that look like fake panes? Munions? Muntins. Muntins. Right. That was close. You were close. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, today's vocabulary corner is brought to you by our good friends <laughs> at No Before. <laughs> yeah, I'm just bringing it up because my son-in-law was surprised I knew the name. <laughs> ah, okay. All right. You must be fun at Trivia Night. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I like to think I'm fun at Trivia Night. Uh, you'd, be a good, you'd be a good team member on a trivia team. Right. You know, there's a lot of things you know. Yeah. All right. Well, again, <laughs> it's all worthless information. Well, but not on trivia night. <laughs> right. That's when go. At that's last. Pay off. Right. Exactly. All all that all that knowledge finally pays off. Right. On trivia night. All right. Well, uh, thank you for sending this in. And again, we would love to hear from you. Our email address is hackinghumans at n2k.com. We want to thank all of you for listening. And of course, we want to thank our sponsors at Know Before. They are experts in helping users do the right thing through new school security awareness training. We'd love to know what you think of this podcast. Your feedback ensures we deliver the insights that keep you a step ahead in the rapidly changing world of cybersecurity. If you like our show, please share a rating and review in your podcast app. Please also fill out the survey in the show notes or send an email to hackinghumans at n2k.com. We're privileged that N2K CyberWire is part of the daily routine of the most influential leaders and operators in the public and private sector, from the Fortune 500 to many of the world's preeminent intelligence and law enforcement agencies. N2K makes it easy for companies to optimize your biggest investment, your people. We make you smarter about your teams while making your teams smarter. Learn how at N2K.com. This episode is produced by Liz Stokes. Our executive producer is Jennifer Iben. We're mixed by Elliot Peltzman and Trey Hester. Our executive editor is Brandon Karp. Peter Kilpie is our publisher. I'm Dave Bittner. And I'm Joe Kerrigan. Thanks for listening.